All right, hello everyone and welcome to our Thursday, first Thursday afternoon session, at least in my time zone, where we're going to be looking at uh, carbon capture, carbon negative technologies. Uh, apologies, I believe my dog is barking in the background. I hope that's not coming through on my microphone. Uh, so just want to welcome you all to the conference again. I'm trying to return to audience view so I can see who's here. There we go. Uh, so look, I always like to start with a little bit of uh, informal just welcome to the session and see how everyone's doing. It's a little bit harder, obviously, in a virtual setting. Uh, but I'd be curious maybe just to do a couple poll questions. I did this yesterday. I won't do the same ones. Uh, but I'd love to hear from the audience, actually. Uh, Lynn, if you don't mind, let's put up a yes, no poll question. Thank you. Uh, how many people are here for the first IEEST conference? Is this your first time at IEEST? At being a loose term, raise your hand. So use the hand raise function in, in the bottom bar if it's your first time here. All right, about a quarter of the room. Awesome. And let, let's let's do that. let's do the flip side so I can see who's actually been here before and who's just not listening. I, I I'm not seeing specific names by the way. This is just my way of getting everyone engaged. Hopefully, uh, so don't worry if if you're not voting. But uh, how many people have been to IEEST before? Raise your hand for this one. I'm going to give this another few seconds because so far we're only about 50%, not even, response rate. Which actually reminds me, so this is probably a good time for me to just do a quick overview of the session. So uh, for those of you who haven't been, been here the last few days or if you've been in and out a little bit, just want to remind you how Shindig works. So at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should see uh, a menu bar that allows you to see the participants list. There's an IM function, uh, which you're welcome to use when we have fewer than 30 people in the room, which we currently do, we're at 24. Uh, everyone can see the same group chat, uh, although if more people join, it'll start to subdivide. So we do recommend if you want to ask a question, use the ask function that will go to the moderator, that will go to the, the room admin who will then pass it on to me and we'll be able to see, see the questions and call on you as things go. If you're having any technical issues, you can use the hand raise function, the one you were just using to vote, to let me know if you've been at IEEST before. You're all muted, you can't hear each other, you can only hear those of us who are on stage. Uh, we're going to have four presentations today. Uh, each one will be about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll take some questions after each one. Uh, I very much encourage participation's questions or comments. Again, part of what we're doing here at the conference is meeting each other, and it's not supposed to be just a one-way flow of information. Again, you'll be able to do that with the, the question asking function. Uh, you'll also be able to do that by joining. We'll open up a podium. So once you see that during the question period, you'll see sort of an open podium on stage. If you hit join, you're welcome to just hit the button, join, we'll see you on stage, and I'll call on you to ask your questions. Okay. Uh, let's give it uh, 10 seconds now if anyone has any questions, comments, or concerns before the session starts. Otherwise, I'll introduce our first speaker. So again, you can use the, the hand raise function if technical issues, or you can use the chat or the, the asking questions initially now to let us know how you're doing. Okay. So seeing none, uh, again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session. Thank you for being here. Uh, our first presenter today is, is Braden Lim. Uh, Braden is a research associate in the mechanical engineering department at Colorado State University uh, under Dr. Jason Quinn. His research focuses on, on understanding the technical and economic feasibility of emerging sustainable technologies such as carbon capture uh, and in motion charging of electric vehicles. Uh, and today he's going to be talking to us about thermal energy storage in carbon capture facilities for, I believe it was natural gas plants, but we'll hear more in a moment. Braden, take it away. That is correct. Thanks, Daniel. Um, let me just share my screen. Does that look good on your end? Looks good to me. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, my name is Braden Lim. I'm a research associate at Colorado State University. And today, my presentation is called The Future of Carbon Capture, A Story of the Tortoise and the Hare. To start things off, I just want to acknowledge ARPA-E for funding this research. Without them and without their funding, none of this would be possible. I also want to acknowledge my research partners at Colorado State University. University of Pennsylvania, Ion Clean Energy, Storeworks Power, and the Nebraska Public Power District. So why carbon capture? Why do we care about carbon capture in general? Um, as many of you know, most of the electricity generated in the United States comes from non-renewable fossil fuel sources such as natural gas, coal, and petroleum. Um, these non-renewable sources emit emissions, which has led to climate change, which is a huge concern across the world today. There's many policies in place that have 
introduce limits on global emissions in the future, which has led to the expectation that no, more renewable energy will be used. Um, but there will always be some sort of need for reserve capacity and reliable power generation. Um, renewable energy can be intermittent at times. We can't predict the weather. And there's also a distribution between when solar energy comes in and when it's actually used and the storage technologies are not there quite yet. Also, we have extreme weather events that have led to issues with the grid already. So there is a need in the power community for more use of reserve capacity and reliable power. One of the best ways to do this is with natural gas um, because you can have base and peak power demands and it's pretty on demand. And so we, for this research, we're combining natural gas with carbon capture to have a reliable source of power and net zero carbon emissions so that it is more sustainable long term. However, carbon capture currently has multiple problems associated with it because it's a pretty new technology. Uh, the first of these is that it places a huge parasitic load on the host power plant. As you can see in the chart on the right, um, a normal natural gas power plant um, can output about 725 megawatts in this case for the ones we're looking at. But if you add carbon capture on that, it goes below 650 megawatts. And this is due to a large heat load that's required by carbon capture to actually sequester the carbon out of the flue gases. And so this places a huge limitation on the technology overall when you can output 10% less power than you could previously. In addition to that, it also limits the overall plant flexibility. So the dash lines on the chart now show the minimum operation uh, output power. And so as you can see, a normal natural gas power plant can both output more power than one with carbon capture and can also output less if there's lower demand. And so we need to overcome these limitations before it's going to be adopted in full. So how are we going to fix these issues? My team and I are researching incorporating thermal storage technologies in addition to natural gas power plants and carbon capture sequestration. So thermal, adding thermal storage will have a multitude of benefits. It allows us to take advantage of natural demand and price profiles for the electricity grid already. So when demand is low during the night, we can use some of the excess power from our power plant to charge our thermal storage systems. And then when you have peak demand later in the day and higher congestion on the network, it allows you to deplete the thermal storage and um, we use both hot and cold thermal storage. So you can use the hot thermal storage to supply heat to the carbon capture unit. And so you don't need that huge parasitic load on the host power plant because all the heat is coming from the thermal storage. So you can output more power to the grid. And you can also use cold thermal storage to chill the inlet air for the power plant, which improves the overall efficiency of the power plant. Um, these two charts just show that adding thermal storage can increase the flexibility of the plant. Uh, the chart on the left shows that there's different power outputs for depending on whether you're charging the thermal storage, running um, in neutral operation mode, which is the same as it would normally, or discharging the thermal storage and outputting all of the power from the power plant to the grid. So you can see you can actually output more power to the grid than a normal natural gas plant because of the improved efficiencies from the cold storage. Additionally, you can also output a smaller minimum amount than traditional technologies. And this is because you can operate at the same point as the orange dash line, but then you can store some of the heat that you're generating in the thermal storage that allows you to put out less power to the grid, which increases the overall flexibility of the power plant for future environments. So where do the tortoise and the hare come in? I like to look at the existing technology as similar to a tortoise in this scenario, because compared to existing technologies, it has limited power. So just like a tortoise would, it can go slower than um, other animals would in the wild per se. It also has limited operating modes. However, it is quite consistent. Once a tortoise starts going, it goes pretty consistently. And that's how a natural gas power plant with carbon capture would be. However, when we incorporate thermal storage with this, it increases the operation modes much more. And so it's much more flexible and it can actually have 
peak power output that's um, much higher than existing natural gas with carbon capture. And so it can have more sprints if you want to refer to it as in the hair scenario, it can sprint and have higher power than normal, but then it can also run at slower operations as well. However, the big problem with this is this technology is unproven and no research has been done on it. And so that's why we're looking at it today. So how do we decide which of these technologies is best? My team and I have developed a three-pronged integrated modeling approach that has a technology model that represents the actual thermal components of each of these systems um, to evaluate them at different operation modes. We then have an optimization and operation model that decides when these power plants would turn on and turn off and when the thermal start storage would charge and discharge based on input electricity demand and price profiles. And then we have an economics model that calculates the profits for the different technologies and determines which of them can create bet, uh, higher profits and be more beneficial to the grid overall. In order to simulate these technologies, we wanted to use real world electricity data. So we pulled data from the wholesale electricity price data across the US. Uh, there's seven different independent system operators and we've chosen to use the New York independent system operator data um, because it has a larger portion of renewable energy like we will see in the future. And it also has higher variability. You can see here on the blue line, that's the New York ISO, a representative node from the New York ISO grid. And there's a lot more variability in the prices which thermal storage is allowed to take advantage of compared to the Southwest Power Pool, which is much more calm and has fewer spikes so that thermal storage wouldn't be as feasible. So then uh, the last thing that uh, we needed to decide is what thermal storage technologies we wanted to use. Currently, we've evaluated 15 different thermal storage configurations ranging from Brayton cycle heat pumps to vapor compression heat pumps. Today, I'm just going to focus on results from pulling steam directly from the natural gas combined cycle power plant, storing the heat for thermal storage, and then using vapor compression for the cold thermal storage side of things. And I'm just showing results on this because it's the best performing configuration that we've looked at to date. So, incorporating this real world data with our models, which of these technologies performs best. This chart shows the results from evaluating all of the nodes in the New York ISO region, which is 548 different nodes or different electricity price profiles. And this compares the two different technologies uh, in terms of net present value or how profitable these plants are. So if you have a negative difference in net present value or you're below the zero line here, that means that the existing non-thermal storage technologies perform better if the uh, data point fall above the zero line uh, that that meant that thermal storage provided a benefit to this technology. You can see it's actually pretty even between the two, which was quite promising for us. We if we look at the actual values, 43% of the New York ISO nodes could benefit from using thermal storage in addition to carbon capture on natural gas power plants, which uh, was extremely good to see because it shows that this technology could be deployed today and it can improve in certain locations better than what the existing technologies could do. In addition to that, uh, when the thermal storage did perform better, it seemed to perform quite a bit better than did uh, the cases without thermal storage, uh, which also provided some benefit in these higher variability cases. If uh, once we got these results, we looked at the actual nodes of where um, thermal storage was performing better. And as I mentioned earlier, we expected that it would perform better in higher variability cases, such as the blue line. And that is exactly what we saw. When there was more renewable energy and more variability in the electricity prices, thermal storage performed better because it could take advantage of the high and low prices to charge and discharge the thermal storage and could overcome the costs of the adding the thermal storage in the first place. Um, when there was limited variability, it did not perform well because there wasn't enough room to make up the profits by adding the thermal storage in the first place. 
We then took these results one step farther and looked at a more general case. So we wanted a way to look at these technologies and evaluate if you had a price profile from anywhere in the world or any future expected price profiles, you could plot it on this chart and see um, which of these technologies would perform better. So this chart has the average electricity selling price on the x-axis, the average discharge or peak electricity price on the y-axis, and then the green line here is the break-even point between the two different technologies. And so if it falls in the blue region, your um, the thermal storage would provide a benefit to the different technologies, and if it falls in the orange region, then the non-thermal storage configurations perform better. I've also plotted the New York ISO um, nodes on this chart as the box and whisker plot, and you can see a little more than 50% are below that green line, uh, equating to the results that we saw earlier. And so um, the next steps for this technology are trying to understand what future price profiles will look like. No one knows what the future will hold. None, none of us have a crystal ball. And so we're actually working with uh, Princeton and NREL and their grid modeling teams to understand what future markets will look like. And so we can evaluate if thermal storage will be beneficial in the future when there's actually a need for carbon capture because there's carbon taxes or stricter re regulations. Initial results from working with these uh, teams and the price profiles that we've got from them show increasing variability as time goes on and there's more renewable generation because it's more intermittent. So as we have increased variability, the electricity price profiles would move from the orange region here to the blue region and would be beneficial to use thermal storage, which is quite encouraging for our technology. And so the way I, like to remember this is if the price profile or the energy demand is more sporadic, kind of like a hair, then thermal storage would win, which is the hair configuration. If they're more stable, then the existing technology without thermal storage performs best. That's all I have to present on today. Uh, some future work that we are currently doing to see uh, is which, if there's any additional thermal storage configurations, then that perform better than the ones that we previously looked at. We're also optimizing uh, existing thermal storage configurations to get decreased capital cost and increased performance to have a greater benefit on in more locations. And we're also working to understand future electricity markets, as I've mentioned before. Uh, that's all I have today. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has or feel free to reach out via email shown on the slide here. Thanks. All right, great, Braden. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I'll throw it over to questions from the audience. Uh, I've got a bunch myself, but let's open up that podium. There we go. Um, I'll try not to go first. So, questions or comments? All right. I have a very low tolerance for for silence, so I'm going to jump in while people are thinking about their questions. Um, so. Brandon, this looks really interesting. So the, the main metric, your NPV, it, that was just based on price arbitrage, correct? So Yes, correct. It's basically okay. charging when prices are low, discharging when prices are high. Did, did you think about any other possible system benefits, right? Like the, the additional capacity, right? Like if there, were, if there were a capacity market or the ability to facilitate future integration of renewables through the increased flexibility. Is that something yeah. you've talked about? Yes, we've talked about multiple of those things. Uh, we haven't found a good way to quantify it yet. Um, there is some wholesale electricity markets right now that have some capacity pricing involved, um, but we haven't run any simulations with that. That's something that's on our to-do list to do though. Yeah, because I would imagine this sort of that increase in peak capacity could be really quite meaningful in, in terms of that additional benefit. Yep, and the, the main benefit for this technology is there's the high prices in the electricity profiles because there's a lot of congestion on the market. And so having that peak capacity or reserve capacity, as I mentioned, can reduce the congestion, which will definitely help. Cool. All right, I'll turn back to the audience. Again, feel free if you want to just join the podium, you're welcome to ask your questions verbally, uh, or if you want to submit through the question ask button, the question mark on the bar at the bottom of your screen, please do so. Again, questions or comments, both welcome. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. 
Uh, like I said, I have a low, low tolerance for silence, and, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, so, it, you know, I may have missed it at the beginning, but so are these facilities that you can retrofit onto existing plants, or do these need to be new builds, or which way were you modeling it? Yeah, uh, so what we modeled was new builds, complete greenfield facilities. We think the actual approach that will happen in the future is to retrofit these technologies. Um, so the benefit of the configuration that I showed results for today, um, you can actually retrofit existing natural gas power plants with it. You're able to pull some steam off from the steam generation side of things. And we're working with a power plant right now to understand the impact of that. But as far as they've told us, that is something we can retrofit, but all of our results are currently new builds. Okay, awesome. All right, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna push the audience now, because again, interactive sessions, I'll do what I do with my students. We'll, we'll let the awkward silence hang. I'd like at least one question or comment from the audience. I'm going to let the silence hang. I know at least one of you has something to say. I've just dumbfounded everyone. They're speechless. <laughs> well, it was, it was, actually, it was a very clear presentation, which is part of it. And obviously, in the online setting, it's very easy to blend into the background. And I'm trying very hard to make this an interactive experience. I'm trying to think, is it, Brent, is there a poll question we can ask them? That's at least an easy, low barrier way to get some. It looks like a question from Casey Quinn just popped up on my screen. It says, how well does uh, carbon capture work at extracting uh, carbon dioxide from natural gas plants? Interesting, that question did not pop up on my screen. I'm not sure why, but go for it, yeah. Yeah, so um, it works quite well. Obviously, it depends on the carbon capture technology. And so existing technologies that are being looked at can capture about 90% of the carbon dioxide from the flue gas of natural gas plants. Um, we're working with a company called Ion Clean Energy who has a proprietary solvent and they have done tests and proven up to 99% capture. And uh, one benefit of their technology is their capital costs are quite a bit less. And so um, we hope to, if our funding comes through for phase two on this project, then we'll be able to build a test facility and test if we can actually do net zero emissions from our carbon capture. Um, but right now, things are looking promising in terms of being able to capture over 90% for sure, um, definitely 95% all the way up to potentially 99% of the carbon. Awesome. Well, thank you, Braden. Uh, everyone, there will be an opportunity at the end when we reconvene. So keep thinking about your questions and, and remember that I'm going to make it awkward if, uh, if you don't have any or comments. Uh, but in the meantime, I think we can move on to our next speaker. Thank you again, Braden. Great, great job. Uh, so our next speaker is Brendan Robbins uh, from the University of Toronto. Uh, Brendan completed his uh, bachelor's in uh, chemical engineering from Queen's University in 2019 and is now completing a Master's of Applied Science at the University of Toronto, co-advised by Professors Heather McLean from Civil Engineering and Bradley Seville from Chemical Engineering. Uh, his research focuses on life cycle assessment and techno-economic assessment of emerging carbon capture and utilization processes, uh, specifically focused on the use of photocatalytic dry methane reforming for low carbon syngas and hydrogen production. So I think we're going to see the, the first presentation, the, the first uh, ever, I think, life cycle assessment of these uh, photocatalyzed dry methane technologies. Brendan, I'm hoping your internet connection is holding up. I know we were having some difficulties before, but I can see your slides. So okay. excellent. And let's just test your sound. Can we hear you? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Awesome. Well, okay. take it away. So hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, as you all know, my name is Brendan Robbins. And I'll be talking a little bit about my research being conducted at the University of Toronto in collaboration with Adriana Gaona, Bradley Seville, and Heather McLean. And specifically, the research is focused on the life cycle assessment of a light driven dry methane reforming process for low carbon syngas and hydrogen production. So, in terms of the agenda, I'll start with a bit of a background on hydrogen and syngas and then get into the photocatalytic dry methane reforming process, which is what I'm evaluating. Uh, then talk a little bit about the research objective, uh, some preliminary LCA work that's been done, and then current work that's in progress. 
So a little bit of a background on hydrogen. Hydrogen is an important chemical reagent used as a feedstock in a wide variety of processes uh, from such things as ammonia production, value-added chemical production, and petrochemistry, in addition to others. Uh, in addition to its use as a chemical reagent, uh, hydrogen is an important clean burning fuel, combusting to pure water as opposed to CO2. So it can be used in a variety of energy applications such as to produce electricity, heat, and transportation. Uh, in terms of syngas, syngas is typically used as a precursor to hydrogen in conventional production methods. And it consists of a gaseous mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So in addition to the use of syngas to produce purified hydrogen, it can also be used directly to produce such things as transportation fuels and value-added chemicals. So approximately 95% of global syngas and hydrogen is produced through carbon intensive steam methane reforming of natural gas. And this poses an issue because if, if carbon intensive hydrogen production is scaled up to meet uh, the growing demand of the industry, this will lead to increased CO2 equivalent, em equivalent emissions and GHG emissions, and an in increased negative impact on global warming and climate change initiatives. So photocatalytic dry methane reforming represents a uh, technology for producing syngas and potentially hydrogen in a low carbon manner. Uh, the reaction requires the conversion of CO2 and methane to hydrogen and carbon monoxide or your syngas. So this pictorial just um, goes through uh, how the process would actually work. So you have the potential to capture CO2, say from industrial emissions, and reroute the CO2 alongside methane from natural gas to a photoreactor, which is essentially a transparent tube that's packed with nanostructured photocatalysts, which uses energy from the light to drive the chemical conversion of the carbon dioxide and methane to the hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And then as mentioned, this syngas can be used uh, for the production of fuels, chemicals, or purified to hydrogen for other applications. So specifically, uh, my research is focused on performing a cradle to gate LCA for hydrogen and methanol production from photocatalytic dry methane reforming. Uh, it addresses the gap in that uh, there is no LCA work currently be being conducted uh, to assess this technology at commercial scale. And it'll be important to perform this type of work to ensure that uh, you're looking at the entire GHG emissions and environmental impacts associated with the whole life cycle of the process, rather than just the um, apparent kind of promise of the technology when you see that it can uh, use carbon capture as well as light energy. So the, uh, the pictorial shown here is a commercial scale life cycle uh, diagram that was developed based on a literature review. It includes processes associated with the carbon capture portion, portion of the process, the natural gas production and delivery, uh, construction and operation of a solar field for collection and concentrating uh, this sunlight, and then uh, some purification stages. So these high temperature water gas shift and low temperature water gas shift stages, which are essentially uh, to take the raw syngas in and then convert the ratio of carbon monoxide to hydrogen towards a more hydrogen rich uh, syngas, which can be used for the production of your products, uh, hydrogen and methanol. So a preliminary LCA was conducted on the portion of the commercial scale model that's outlined in red. Uh, it utilized light, the light source of sunlight and um, was done using a functional unit of one kilogram of one-to-one -one hydrogen to carbon monoxide syngas, which is just based on the stoichiometry of the dry methane reforming reaction. And for the analysis, a plant capacity of 1,000 kilograms of hydrogen per day was chosen. And the impact category of interest when doing this analysis was GWP, or the global warming potential, in kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions. So a major part of this preliminary analysis was estimating the impacts associated with the solar field. Uh, so to generate these impacts, the ATS fourth generation heliostat, heliostat prototype was chosen uh, to model kind of the heliostat and solar field. So this represents um, a heliostat that is essentially a giant mirror that is used to reflect the sunlight and concentrated on your area of interest. So in this case, the photoreactor. And this model was chosen just based on availability of inventory data and literature. In terms of a location for this analysis, uh, Southern California was selected uh, based on high solar irradiance, according to uh, data provided by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And for the analysis, a base case solar to syngas efficiency of 80% was selected. 
And this solar to syngas efficiency uh, simply represents the amount of energy that's being uh, converted from the light, the sunlight, into uh, energy that can be used as products. Um, so the picture down here just represents kind of the methodology that was used to determine the number of heliostats or the giant mirrors uh, you would need in the field. And then from there to generate the impacts associated with them. So the solar to syngas efficiency equation uh, shown on the left here uh, was used to solve for the P solar irradiation, which is essentially your energy requirement needed to produce the amount of product you're looking at. Uh, and then the solar irradiance data provided by National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, for this location in Southern California was used to determine the amount of energy that's supplied from the sun. And uh, the discrepancy between the energy supply and requirement was used to determine how many heliostats of this uh, ATS fourth generation model you would need based on each heliostat having an area of approximately 148 meters squared. So preliminary LCA results indicate that you can get to the raw syngas um, with negative 0.45 kilogram CO2 equivalent emissions per kilogram of syngas uh, based on a credit for carbon capture. However, this is a very, very preliminary value. So it's not indicative of a uh, entire technology that's carbon negative. It's solely looking at that portion of the commercial scale diagram that was outlined. And it needs to be built upon to include the downstream product associated emissions. So emissions associated with uh, purification of the raw syngas. Uh, and this, this diagram is simply to provide a bit of perspective. So the specific values don't matter so much here at this stage of the analysis, but uh, this, this diagram shows the GWP in terms of kilograms of hydrogen produced. And that levelization was done just to be able to compare it to values in the literature for steam methane reforming, which are typically done uh, levelized to the amount of hydrogen made. And the purpose of including this diagram was to just show kind of the breathing room between where it's at now and where um, it will become less competitive with steam methane reforming. So the ranges shown for the SMR in the orange and gray bars are for steam methane reforming with carbon capture and sequestration and no carbon capture respectively. Uh, so it's important to see that although like uh, it, it's pretty promising right now as there's a sufficient gap between them, this will close as you begin to add uh, the downstream processes to the model. So one of the major objectives of this preliminary model was to assess how the solar field actually contributes to overall GHG emissions. So to do that, the lifetime of the plant was varied from 20 to 30 years, uh, knowing that typically the heliostat lifetime is around 25 years. So in this 30 year plant lifetime uh, case, you would need a replacement of the heliostat field. And we wanted to see how that affected the overall GHG results. And what was noticed is that even with a replacement of the solar field, there was a negligible difference um, in the GHG contribution from the solar field being 0.3% at the 20 year plant lifetime and then 0.4% at the 30 year plant lifetime. So further supporting this, um, the solar to syngas efficiency was varied from 25 to 100% at a 25% step. And it was also noticed that there was no uh, significant change in the contribution from the solar field construction and operation with the maximum contribution of uh, 1% at 25% solar to syngas efficiency. So even at very low solar to syngas efficiency, uh, these preliminary results indicate that using sunlight might be a viable option uh, for this type of technology from a GWP perspective. So some um, preliminary uh, LCA conclusions based on this preliminary modeling include that natural gas production and delivery dominate GWP. So one avenue to look into might be um, additional sources of the methane, such as biomass, which may act to decrease the total GWP of the process. Uh, the global warming potential associated with the solar field construction and operation is minimal. And it was irrespective of the solar to sig gas efficiency that was chosen and the plant lifetime. So it might actually be a viable option in terms of GWP to use, um, to use natural sunlight as opposed to artificial lighting. And finally, uh, before the actual carbon status of the process can be identified, the additional life cycle, life cycle stages must be included in the model to get a stronger um, 
to be able to more strongly conclude as to the carbon status of the technology. And then I just have one final slide uh, where I wanted to go through some current work that's in progress uh, to build upon the, uh, the model that's been conducted and the LCA that's been conducted. So currently um, we're working on doing some water gas shift modeling in uh, Aspen Plus software to determine inventory data associated with the high temperature water gas shift and low temperature water gas shift as shown in this commercial scale diagram. The, um, another avenue we're looking into is a comparison between LED lighting and the use of the solar field. So we know that the LED lighting would reduce the land burden associated with the solar field, but we don't yet know how it would compare on a GWP perspective. And then finally, we're looking at kind of beefing up the impacts uh, and the inventory data associated with the photoreactor portion of the model, so the solar reforming portion. And um, we're going to be looking into doing some computational fluid dynamic modeling to uh, capture some of the light transport characteristics and determine an appropriate size of the photoreactor at a commercial scale which then can be used in uh, Aspen Plus modeling to generate inventory data associated with that portion of the model. And that's everything I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. All right, thank you, Brendan. Really nice presentation. Obviously a lot of work's gone into this. Uh, I'll, I'll kick it off while people are starting to type their questions, hopefully, and also then if we could put up an extra podium in case anyone wants to ask uh, orally. Um, but so, Brendan, can you tell us a little bit about the, the scalability of this? You know, would this be able, would this technology be able to be used in really large facilities that could compete with current steam methane reforming? So that is a good question. Right now, the technology is, um, it's being mainly used in proof of concept studies at lab and pilot scale to show technological viability at that scale. But the issue is that in the lab and pilot scale, they typically use really controlled conditions. Uh, so they use lamps as opposed to actual sunlight. Um, so they don't get that variability. So when scaling up to the large scale, it's gonna be difficult um, to prove technological viability but hopefully through the um, estimates we hope to achieve on the photoreactor modeling portion of it, we can get some good understanding of how it would perform environmentally and then do uh, going further into extending into how it would actually compete economically. But until, um, until larger scale studies are done that actually utilize sunlight, there is a bit of a gap that needs to be bridged uh, for scale up to occur. Okay, awesome, thanks. And I see we have a question uh, from Yuan. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. I have a question on the natural gas inputs. Is it still from fossil? And have you thought of using biogas? Yeah, so right now the model- and Actually, Brendan, you know, sorry, let me just interrupt you for one second. You're actually still showing your slide. Do you wanna, if you take it down, maybe we can see you. Is that okay? Sorry. There you go, sorry, go ahead. So there's a question about fossil gas and have you thought about using biomass? Yeah, so- the original model was set up using uh, petroleum derived natural gas. I know that uh, some techno-economic studies have shown that that's the most uh, economic based on the, in the information they have available to do their work. But biogas has been mentioned as a potential alternative that could potentially uh, reduce the GWP of the process. So I think that is something we might be getting into uh, going forward, looking at how uh, biogas actually compares in terms of global warming potential with this natural gas model. Great, thanks. And I see Braden's joined us on stage. Hey, Braden, go for it. Yeah, great talk, Brandon. It was super interesting. I have a question about the syngas that um, you're producing here. One of the problems with the carbon research that I'm doing is we produce compressed CO2, but there's not a lot of uses for it. I was wondering, I'm not too familiar with syngas, so is that just able to use in normal internal combustion engines. And then my main question is, does that generate the same emissions after you burn it in whatever way you burn it that it would previously? And how do we sequester those emissions? Yeah, so syngas can be used directly as fuel, but I'm not too sure about how um, it compares in terms of its use in internal combustion engines, if it can be used directly 
or if there's got to be some sort of a purification stage before you can use it. Uh, but I know that in terms of additional uses for it, you can also shift the sim gas uh, ratio in whatever direction you want. So you can go towards hydrogen and that um, uh, that like uh, can be used for purifying hydrogen specifically or for producing methanol, which is essentially a two to one hydrogen to carbon monoxide ratio. But you can also shift in the other direction uh, where you actually increase the carbon monoxide ratio. And then it can be used in the, uh, the Fischer tropes process to produce hydrocarbon fuels that then can be used uh, in replace of the usual hydrocarbon fuels. And then when you burn that syn gas, does it generate the same emissions that it would previously? Yeah, I think then when you burn it after it's gone through the FT process, it would mimic the same emissions as it would with the regular hydrocarbon fuels. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Braden. I think we have time for maybe one more question, if there is one. I see uh, Cindy's joined us. Hey, Cindy, please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, I have been working with um, LCAs regarding gas fermentation to biofuels or to biochemicals. And as far as I have worked with them, um, syngas is being used because it's a waste material, for example, from um, um, the... Um, from other industries. So it is kind of curious for me that um, why would we need to produce additional singas? Is the waste material not enough? Or yeah, like kind of the motivation of producing additional singas if we already have a lot of waste that we want is to um, like reincorporate into the value chain uh, instead of producing additional one. Do you know something about this? Uh, that's a very good question. I have not, not actually explored anything involving recycling syngas that's already used, but that could be a good option uh, for me to look into because, as you mentioned too, you could get some sort of credits in terms of global warming potential as well if you're using it from already kind of industrialized processes uh, to then convert into hydrogen. I'm not sure how uh, it compares between uh, like changing the infrastructure from steam methane reforming to this process. But one of the things is that steam methane reforming that typically is used to produce the same gas now uh, is very carbon intensive in terms of its heating source. Uh, so it requires really high amount of energy and typically that's supplied by fossil fuels. So by actually replacing the entire the process with this process, uh, with this new process, uh, you might be able to significantly decrease the GHG emissions associated with the entire life cycle. But uh, as far as how that, like um, the details of how those would actually compare, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but it might be something good to look into. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting because for example, Landsat Tech works with waste singas from other industries. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to know why we will be producing producing uh, like new singas if that's like a co-product of an existing industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. So again, we'll, have, we'll loop back at the end when we reconvene as a panel. Uh, again, thank you, Brendan, great presentation. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is gonna be uh, Sam, Samuel Cooper, uh, coming from the University of Bath. So representing the international contingent, I guess Canada, the overseas contingent, because Brendan's from Canada. So Sam's representing the overseas contingent of the, the session today. Uh, so Sam is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bath and the Faculty of Engineering uh, with a research focus on industrial emissions and bioenergy. And today he's going to be talking to us about uh, biomass to deliver hydrogen and negative emissions. So Sam, I see you're on stage. Please take it away. Cool. Thank you. Um, hey, let me just, uh, sorry, Daniel, just trying to share some slides here. Sure. Um, so you've got the screen share button that should be right at the top of your own image. Do you see it? Yeah, it's Firefox that's being funny. Um, I'm gonna. Re I'll read out a comment. What? So you go ahead and play with that for a second, or chat with Lynn if if you need help. Uh, but we had a comment from uh, Scott Matthews in the chat, just following on from the last uh, from the last presentation, which is uh, you know there are many ways to make syn gas. There was discussion 15 years ago to burn coal and make syn gas to then run it in natural gas fired power plants. Again, I know some of you may be able to see that, but uh, some of you may not be able to see it without me reading it out. So 
How you doing, Sam? Can I help at all? Uh, yeah, I should have. Um... Have you got the slides there at all? Daniel, they I, I can pull them up. If you want, we can also skip ahead to the next speaker and we can come back if you need a moment. Uh, do, do you know what's what's gone wrong? Yeah, Just basically, um, I should have, we should have tested this before. It's um, the security, it won't let me, basically, it won't let me um, share the, the screen as far as I can see. OK, uh, why don't we go ahead, why don't we skip ahead to Shrajana and you should have, you can have a chat with Lynn in the meantime. Brilliant, thank you. So Shrijana, do you mind, or sorry, uh, Lynn, do you mind putting up uh, Shrijana's, or queuing up Shrijana's talk? So we're going to skip ahead. Uh, we'll come back to Sam. Uh, so our next speaker is a, a, a pre-recorded talk uh, from uh, Shrijana Ren from uh, KeyLogic. So Shrijana works as a support contractor to the US DOE National Energy Technology Laboratory. She specializes in the natural gas supply chain and products like fossil, liquefied, and renewable natural gas. She's co-authored multiple government reports on these topics, and today she'll be sharing her work on renewable natural gas with us. Uh, so because it is a pre-recorded talk, Shrijana will be available for questions afterwards. And if you want to put anything in the chat, even during the talk, she may be able to respond to some of your questions. We're back down below 30 people, which means the chat works and everyone should be able to see that for now. So Lynn, are we able to go ahead and pop up Shrijana's talk? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Srijana Rai, and I work as a life cycle analyst specializing in the natural gas supply chains on a contract with the US DOE National Energy Technology Lab in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, today, I'll talk about the life cycle assessment that we recently performed on renewable natural gas supply chain with a focus on the global warming potential impacts. Uh, this is a quick disclaimer that the results and conclusion being presented today are my findings and opinions and do not necessarily represent that of the government. Um, the main motivation behind this work is the increased interest in natural gas from renewable sources as a strategy to decarbonize the na uh, natural gas sector. Here we perform an attributional and a consequential uh, LCA of three common uh, RNG production pathways with multiple feedstocks and processing technologies. We evaluated anaerobic digestion, thermal gasification and power to gas pathways for uh, RNG production. I'll discuss the exa exact feedstocks of these pathways and the system boundaries in the upcoming slides. The three proposed uh, pathways have a functional unit of one megajoule of compressed RNG, which is ready to be injected into the natural gas uh, transmission network. To understand how the GHG impacts of these pathways compare to today's natural gas market, we also evaluated the GWP impacts of uh, corresponding business as usual scenarios uh, that have a functional unit of one megajoule of pipeline-ready fossil natural gas and waste management of the mass of feedstock that would be needed to produce a megajoule of RNG in the corresponding RNG scenario. Let me explain this once again because uh, this is an important unit to understand. The functional unit of the business as usual scenarios is one megajoule of fossil natural gas plus waste management of let's say x kilograms of biomass feedstock where x is the amount of this feedstock that would be needed to produce a megajoule of RNG in its corresponding uh, RNG feedstock pathway. The outcome of this work is an open LCA model that compares the proposed RNG pathways amongst themselves and also with the fossil natural gas uh, pathway while maintaining a, uh, consistent modeling techniques and system boundaries. Um, now let's talk about the system boundaries of the, all the, each pathway separately. First, let's look at the boundary for anaerobic digestion pathway. This boundary starts with the AD unit and does not include feedstock transportation because uh, literature suggested that AD units are generally uh, co-located with the source of the feedstock. The feedstocks evaluated here are uh, animal manure, collected landfill gas, uh, US average mix of municipal solid waste and wastewater sludge. These feedstocks first go through the AD unit where the organic material uh, in the uh, biomass is broken down in the absence of uh, oxygen, generating a biogas which is composed of methane, carbon dioxide and small amounts of water vapor and trace gases. This biogas is then cleaned and upgraded to remove the carbon dioxide, water and the other trace gases to produce an approximately 99% methane content uh, RNG product which is then compressed uh, to bring it to the optimal pressure for pipeline injection. For the biogas cleaning and upgrading process, we model three different technologies. 
high pressure water scrubbing, amine scrubbing using MDEA and amine scrubbing with MEA. In the interest of time, I'll skip the detailed explanations of these processes, but in short, they are all two-stage processes where the high pressure water or amine reacts with the biogas to strip it of the carbon dioxide and other gases, leaving a predominantly methane stream of the RNG uh, product. The high pressure water scrubbing method is the most common cleaning and upgrading method which is used for all the feedstocks uh, whereas the two amine scrubbing methods are only used for the wastewater sludge uh, feedstock. Uh, for this pathway and the others uh, our boundary accounts for all the heat, electricity and other energy flows uh, in the process. Now let's look at the boundary for the thermal gasification pathway. Uh, here we use wood waste from landfill uh, as the feedstock. The boundary starts with feedstock transportation and pre-treatment uh, to dry and resize the biomass before it is fed into the gasification unit. Uh, gasification is a thermochemical process where biomass is converted to syngas which is composed of carbon dioxide, methane, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, water, higher hydrocarbons and other impurities. The gasification process reacts a controlled amount of air, steam or catalyst with available carbon in the biomass in a gasifier at high temperatures. The resultant syngas from the gasification unit goes through multiple screening, scrubbing, heating and cooling cycles and reacts with catalysts that remove all impurities, water and heavy hydrocarbons. The, result the resultant clean syngas is then fed into a methanation reactor where the hydrogen, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide react with catalysts to form biomethane or the RNG product, which is then compressed for pipeline injection. Uh, now let's look at the boundaries for the power to gas pathway. The, this pathway uses renewable electricity to produce hydrogen from water electrolysis which is then reacted with carbon dioxide in a methanation uh, unit to yield uh, RNG which is compressed for uh, pipeline injection. This methanation is different from the methanation we saw in the thermal gasification pathway. Here we need to feed carbon and catalysts uh, with hydrogen to the uh, methanation unit so it can generate methane. In the thermal gasification uh, uh, methanation system, the syngas entering the methanation unit already has carbon in it. So it only needs catalysts to produce the methane. Lastly, let's look at the boundaries for the business as usual scenarios. As explained in the very first slide, the business as usual consists of pipeline ready natural gas, uh, which includes production, gathering and boosting and processing uh, of uh, natural gas to make it pipeline ready. Here we use the results from NETL's natural gas LCA model and then we add the impacts of conventional waste management uh, which would otherwise now be used in RNG gen uh, production. At this time I'd also like to take a moment to explain how we process, how we perform a co consequential LCA using the same information. Uh, the GWP impact of waste management here is subtracted from its corresponding uh, RNG feedstock scenario. We don't subtract the impact of uh, fossil natural gas because RNG does not displace uh, the same unit of fossil natural gas directly, but it does displace the uh, a unit of waste directly that was that would otherwise have to be treated or managed uh, conventionally. Okay, so now that we understand the boundaries, units, and methods, uh, let's let's look at the results from this LCA. First, we'll look at the uh, results from just the attributional LCA, uh, which means it does not include the waste management uh, processes yet. Uh, the gate-to-gate -gate GWP impact of uh, the RNG pathways ranges anywhere from 17 to 68 grams of CO2 equivalents per megajoule of compressed uh, RNG. However, these results should not be used to draw any conclusions yet because the introduction of waste management in the business as usual or consequential scenarios will change how we interpret these results. Uh, the results are only helpful to understand, these results are only helpful to understand the stage level GHG emissions from various RNG production processes. To understand this point, let's focus on the anaerobic digestion of animal manure pathway. Here, it is one of the highest impactful pathways, but when we introduce waste management, we'll see how that changes things. In this graph, we added the business as usual scenarios along with their corresponding RNG uh, proposed scenarios. And here we can instantly see that the animal manure anaerobic digestion pathway has the big biggest difference between its business as usual and proposed uh, scenarios. 
This is mainly because in business as usual, animal manure emits a significant amount of methane uh, during traditional management techniques. Therefore, when we capture this methane to produce RNG, it reduces the GWP impact of this uh, uh, feedstock by 79%. Uh, this analysis also shows that not all pathways are beneficial in terms of GHG emissions as compared to the business as usual. Uh, as we can see, the anaerobic digestion pathway with municipal solid waste and wastewater sludge as feedstock have higher GWP impacts um, when, when these feedstocks are used to generate RNG as compared to the business as usual. Uh, here we see the results of the consequential LCA, which basically subtracts the emissions from the conventional waste management uh, from its proposed scenarios to account for the avoided emissions due to RNG production. This is the best place to draw final conclusions. Here we again see that anaerobic digestion of animal manure is the least impactful method or pathway with a GWP impact of minus 229 grams of CO2e per megajoule of compressed RNG. We also see that RNG production via thermal gasification of uh, wood waste using air or um, catalyst gasification techniques lead to net negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The landfill gas pathway and the thermal gasification pathway using steam gasification have net positive GHG impacts, uh, but they are still better than the uh, fossil natural gas uh, GWP impact, which is 10 grams of CO2e per megajoule of compressed gas. And all the other pathways um, seen here have actually higher GWP impacts as compared to um, production of fossil natural gas. In conclusion, uh, the key takeaway from this work is that not all RNG pathways can be labeled carbon neutral or carbon negative. Um, out, of the three, out of the 10 scenarios that we evaluated here, only three had net negative GHG impacts. Two had positive impacts, but uh, they were still lower than the impact from uh, fossil natural gas. And the remaining five scenarios actually had higher impacts than the fossil natural gas uh, pathway. Um, to make all the RNG pathways environmentally beneficial, there is a need for more research to identify either emission mitigation strategies or new technologies in the RNG supply chain, especially when it comes to the positive pathways that we saw uh, to make them more favorable. Yeah, with that, I have come to an end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions now or at the end of the session or even via email after the conference. Thank you. All right, Shrijana, thank you for that really nice talk. And again, a lot of work obviously went into covering the different pathways. So questions, questions from the audience. And we've got one right away, excellent, thanks, John. Uh, so nice talk. Uh, would you elaborate on what waste management technologies are included in the business as usual scenario? Yeah, I, I was actually thinking something similar. So. Yeah, I actually uh, had a slide in there, but then because of time, I kind of got rid of that. Uh, so with the uh, rest of our model is a process based model. Again, bunch of different data sources, uh, uh, GHG, uh, US EPA data sources. And then uh, GREET is one of the sources that we used uh, for the processes we model. For waste management, uh, we didn't do an as detailed process-based uh, modeling. We only used reported data to various government sources. Uh, so for example, for animal manure, we used uh, GHGI data uh, to kind of evaluate, uh, just estimate a methane emission rate for each gram of uh, animal manure management. Um, same for, yeah, for landfill-based uh, feedstock. So landfill gas, municipal solid waste, uh, again, it was a US average mix of municipal solid waste and even wood waste. Um, and for wastewater sludge, we had to rely on a literature uh, source where, um, again, we there were various assumptions in different feedstocks. So for wastewater sludge, we assumed um, uh, that it's going to be applied to land. Usually, it's just a land application. So we used the emission rate from that and um, yeah, just evaluated emission rates based on literature and reported data. Great. Thank you. And we have another question also from Jan, uh, which is, uh, would you provide some details on how the impacts of different biomass feedstock on gas yields and emissions were considered in your model for the anaerobic digestion pathway? So I'm going to read that question again. Uh, details on how the impacts of different biomass feedstock on gas yields and emissions. Yeah, so um, again, um, the for I think for, yeah, for uh, animal, uh, sorry, anaerobic digestion we had agreed was one of our biggest data sources and depending on the feedstock the carbon content of the biogas 
changes. So, uh, for example, for animal manure, we assumed 75% cattle and 25% swine mix. And yeah, so there were various assumptions in there. And yeah, basically carbon content of the biogas will um, be different. And depending on that, the processes will have different uh, emissions or the leaks from the uh, processes will be different. And that's why it depends on the feedstock. Um, I, I am not sure if I understood that question correctly, uh, exactly, but yeah, I'll be happy to elaborate more if you want to uh, ask a follow up question. Yeah, so you on just let us know either through the ask function or you can join the podium if, if there's more to follow up. Uh, but we've got a question coming in from Sam as well, which is thanks. Uh, lots of information and work there. Is there written is this written up in a report that we can look at for more detail? Uh, yes, so we are in the process of uh, publishing a journal article, a journal paper. Right now, it's under review with NETL, so it might be a few months before it actually hits uh, public view. Uh, but yes, all of this work and all the assumptions and data sources behind it will be available uh, hopefully pretty soon uh, uh, in one of the journal, yeah, one of the high impact journals. Does, does NETL also put this out in um, in reports, or it goes just through the the conventional peer reviewed journal? Uh, so, yeah, this one is going to be a peer-reviewed uh, journal. It's not going to be an NETL report yet. Okay. Thanks. All right. Other questions? I'll ask one, which is just curious. Did you look at all... Uh, this is sort of similar, actually, to what I asked Brendan, just about the scale and sort of the, the available feedstock from these different sources. You know, how much RNG can we really make? <laughs> Yeah, no, that is a great question. I have actually attended a lot of talks where people talk about this. Uh, that was not uh, exactly in our scope for this work, but we do intend on doing more work on RNG where we um, kind of, yeah, understand the market, RNG market, how much is actually possible, how much biomass do we have available to generate uh, RNG. And also maybe do some uh, techno-economic analysis to understand the costs behind these things. Because right now we only evaluated the greenhouse gas emissions, but I'm sure when cost comes in picture, that's where you know the actual decision making happens. So sure, sure. Uh, that's although once point. you know some of them are worse from an emission standpoint, it saves you the trouble of working out the cost model, right? Right, exactly. So this was the first step where we just understand the greenhouse gas emissions. Hopefully, in the future, we'll also see other impacts uh, in addition to the GWP impacts and understand the cost and uh, you know market uh, view of this uh, of the product. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's let's pause it there. Again, we'll have a chance right at the end. Uh, let's go back to Sam. I think we've got the, the technical issues sorted. So I gave the introduction to Sam before, but just a reminder that he's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bath in the Faculty of Engineering. You'll hear about his research when he presents it. <laughs> I'll save myself the time. Hey, Sam. Cool. Okay. So hopefully, is that working this time? On my end, it says you are sharing. It's still yet to pop up. Okay. But it does seem to be in progress. Awesome. Uh, well, while that's while that's going, um, hi everybody. Um, yeah, greetings from the UK, from Bath. Here, um, I'm so Sam Cooper. I'm working with Marcel, and um, I I think she couldn't make it um, today, but sort of says hello to anybody here who who knows her. Um, yeah, so I'm going to keep this talk fairly general. And I guess with just sort of 10 minutes, the idea is, uh, you know, if this is interesting, then please get in touch. And I'll, so we've got our links there and stuff. And there's a couple more, which I'll show in a moment. Um, Sam, I'm actually still not seeing your screen. Uh, I don't know if someone else can confirm. I'm still seeing sharing screen dot, dot, dot. Lynn, are you available to help us figure out what's going on? Let's try this again. Hang on, let me just do the same thing. Um, Oh, I see myself. Okay, that's. I see the problem. infinite. Yeah, there we go. Now I see yeah. it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for your patience there. So, yes. Yeah, so with that, um, so I guess again, so bio biohydrogen, and um, I think we've heard quite a bit about sort of related things so far. So that's that's been uh, really interesting. Um, I thought if you're here, uh, it's quite possible you're interested in um, projects related to this. So I was just going to choose a couple of them. First is the SuperGen Bioenergy Project. Which um, so for the UK, um, which I guess is the kind of context I'm coming from, um, this is uh, like a fairly large consortium of academic uh, partners uh, looking at bioenergy across the supply chain from resources through to um, sort of processing options or some experimental work there, through to um, what what we're looking at, which is kind of the vectors and how best to use that energy. 
And so um, they've got like a, a mailing list and Twitter and all kinds of stuff. So this is something which is interesting. Um, as a sort of academic group for the UK for bioenergy, this would be uh, certainly something which I'd recommend you have a look at. And then the next one, uh, this is called IDRIC, um, which again is a, a relatively large sort of academic uh, group. It's maybe about 40 um, academic partners. Um, and they're looking at industrial decarbonisation, uh, focusing on there's really kind of six um, sort of hubs in the UK where uh, industrial hubs where there's the sort of heavy industry. And these are the, the locations where it's likely um, that sort of CO2 transport and storage sort of infrastructure and hydrogen um, sort of production, storage and transport infrastructure are likely to be developed first. And so really, the I mean, this might be interesting just generally, in which case, have a look at the website. It's just starting out. In this context, um, really, the, the, uh, the relevance is that this is where we would see bioenergy and certainly biohydrogen um, being first applied and where we think it's got the most potential to be appropriate and um, to have real benefits. OK, so with that said, uh, so why biohydrogen? Um, so really, there's two, two aspects to this, which I think are worth kind of just saying. And it kind of sounds a bit cute, but I think it's useful. So the first is why hydrogen? Um, so we have our sort of bioenergy group and they're like, well, we've got our bio bioenergy. It's very flexible. It's very useful. Uh, but there's lots of things we could do with it. And it's a limited resource. Uh, why would we use it for hydrogen? And um, actually, as I uh, was sort of said earlier, uh, it's, it's useful in terms of there's obviously no uh, combustion, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also it's suitable for like a range of different things, uh, both as an energy source and also as a feedstock for other processes. Um, and some of those, it may be, um, uh, there might be other alternatives, uh, transport and so on. Uh, so I think maybe the jury's out in terms of how that's going to end up. For some applications, um, notably so industry and power generation, some aspects of power generation is what we're kind of thinking of the start offs. Um, the case is pretty strong, I think, that hydrogen is a suitable um, energy vector to um, take those forwards. So then the other aspect of this, why biomass? Um, so we have our sort of uh, people looking at sort of industry and stuff, and they're like, well, hydrogen's good, but there's lots of other ways we can make hydrogen. Um, so why biomass? And again, it's probably fairly straightforward. The, the point is we can capture that biogenic carbon. Um, we could either, so there's, uh, I mean, to a large extent, our, our focus is uh, sort of the slightly more technically mature thermochemical routes like gasification and maybe uh, pyrolysis. Uh, but of course, there's also sort of some of the photo um, catalysis and biogenic routes, uh, bi biological routes, which, which might be options. But essentially, we can capture that carbon and achieve um, in, in hopefully we could achieve some negative life cycle emissions, which is obviously very attractive. So I'm just going to look at a couple of slides where uh, just a sort of a couple of examples of some results um, and sort of a couple of things to think about. And then we're just going to work through uh, a few sort of general conclusions from some from a workshop which we did. So here this is looking at uh, this is kind of a meta analysis of different studies looking at um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with different um, energy routes. So we've got our little blue dots are um, the, oops. Sorry, little blue dots are um, sort of Beck's electricity generation. We've got the little uh, crosses um, are biohydrogen um, routes. And then for comparison, we've got a few green uh, diamonds, which are sort of SMR um, hydrogen production with these, these bottom three um, having CCS and the other one not. Um, so even, I mean, we could maybe use sort of a slight alternative to SMR, like um, autothermal reforming, where uh, the process is a little bit more um, set up for carbon capture. Uh, but even then, there's going to be some residual emissions because um, a lot of this is sort of upstream supply uh, chain emissions. So the, the, the big takeaway from this is, yes, um, there's lots of studies looking at negative emissions from uh, biohydrogen uh, routes and the potential for that. Taking it a little step further, uh, this graph on the right here. Um, hang on. So on our uh, one of the things you're saying is that uh, for a lot of energy um, uh, LCA and greenhouse gas emissions assessments, um, the, the functional unit is per energy of out, uh, of energy delivered, basically. Um, so this would be um, basically the y-axis, where we're saying these are the greenhouse gas emissions per kilowatt hour of energy sort of output. Um, for bioenergy, I think increasingly, um, hopefully as we see its role expanding, and it becomes a, um, a the actual availability of the biomass becomes a constraint 
um, and is really the sort of the limiting factor. Um, actually, arguably, um, for some policy decisions and some sort of decision making, um, it's going to be the um, the energy input which is the limiting factor, which and perhaps a more appropriate functional unit. So here on the x-axis, we're looking at how much is the uh, what's the greenhouse gas emissions per um, per unit of biomass energy input. And so here, because uh, the hydrogen production routes are uh, more efficient than the um, electricity production routes, um, actually, uh, although sort of on, on an energy output basis, um, the, uh, the electricity looks more carbon negative, um, on an energy input basis, um, they're quite similar. And in some cases, the um, hydrogen production routes are more carbon negative. Uh, so just another uh, quick thing to think about in terms of this whole BEX uh, electricity versus BEX hydrogen uh, options um, sort of thing to think about. Um, so I guess this is kind of specific to the UK uh, in that it's, it's modeling the, um, the UK electrical grid, but it's going to be a similar story uh, elsewhere. And actually, as, as, as Bryn touched on earlier, um, basically, the, the, the consideration is that to um, more or less extent in different areas, um, variable electricity uh, generation is likely to increase just because it's the lowest cost, uh, low carbon uh, option. And so um, basically the load factor, which is available to dispatchable generation uh, operators, is going to decrease um, and potentially quite significantly. And so perhaps there's this kind of space within this for a few gigawatts in a UK context for um, dispatchable generation with a decent uh, load factor. Um, for a lot of it, they're going to have to contend with quite low load factors. And the economics of this really get quite challenging uh, when you've got something like a BEX plant with high capital costs um, and, and that sort of complexity. So on the sort of the, the, the converse side of this, actually for hydrogen BEX uh, options, they really don't have to worry about this uh, as much. There's a, a, a more diversified um, set of energy demands, but of course also hydrogen can be stored. Um, and it's likely... Um, for the various other hydrogen options, this is going to be necessary anyway. So we see a good role for hydrogen um, for bioenergy in this in this context. Okay. So um, yeah, so just kind of just a couple of slides left. Um, so we did a workshop um, back in January with a, with a bunch of academics, industry um, representatives, and policymakers, uh, and there were a few kind of interesting things which came out of that. So um, basically, just going to run through those. There's a, there's a few relating to greenhouse gas emissions here and then on the next slide there's a few relating to um, kind of the route ahead the way forwards <clears throat> Excuse me. so on the greenhouse gas emissions side of things uh, hopefully this is um, kind of preaching to the choir for IST but there are a bunch of different environmental and social impacts which are not just greenhouse gas emissions um, and increasingly uh, those might be might, might be the things which differentiate between where we've got some very good options in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions uh, these other considerations might be the things which really differentiate between them um, sort of following on from that, uh, this second point, there are, um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of tempted to sort of look at greenhouse gas emissions sort of performance and think of it as a single score for each technology and things which could, we can compare. Um, in reality, often these uh, reflect the optimization choices of the people who are developing them. Um, and so we need to be really careful in terms of just doing comparisons um, that actually uh, not only are the comparisons on a like for like basis, but also that we're not just comparing um, the priorities of the people developing them rather than sort of what's inherent to the technologies themselves. And similarly uh, on that, um, I, I actually don't know the situation in um, other places, but for, for the UK, one of the issues is that some um, support mechanisms, basically they have a yes or no kind of eligibility um, criteria um, uh, for say, um, entering into bids for, for low carbon technologies. And um, uh, potentially looking forward where we have uh, these other options which can actually create much better um, performances from a greenhouse gas perspective. Um, this might not incentivize them uh, as much as we'd like. So path ahead, just a few points uh, to highlight. The first is that these technologies, um, they, they work, um, but really for them to be effective, they need to be within that broader uh, environment, so broader context. So there's the infrastructure, of course, the physical infrastructure. There's also the regulatory uh, and commercial environment to actually make them happen. And this actually is perhaps the uh, a, a bigger sort of uh, bigger headache. Um, in particular, um, one of the things is uh, this potential chicken and egg between um, feedstocks, um, the processes, 
and then um, the offtake agreements, um, where people don't want to um, invest a lot in a supply if they're not sure about the demand. And similarly, people aren't going to be prepared to set up a large demand if they're uh, really uncertain about the supply chain. So um, here, I mean, this is, this is fixable um, and commercial demonstration, actually um, getting these things working at a decent scale um, and really uh, reassuring people is, is a key part of that. But it, it is a challenge which needs to be addressed. Um, so the next thing is, and, and sorry, and also I guess part of that is, as I say earlier, um, finding those, those requirements that which actually really fit well with hydrogen. So uh, again, we're thinking uh, some of the industrial demands um, and some of the some aspects of power demands um, really fit best in that. And then uh, kind of the final uh, thing, which I think is worth just noting on this, is uh, there's different options for scaling up. We can go for like big scale uh, to achieve economies of scale, kind of. Um, uh, typical of like the energy uh, sort of supply industry, you know, maybe a sort of gigawatt kind of um, large scale. Um, the other option, which may be more suitable, especially where we have um, sort of biogenic waste inputs and things which are inherently more localized, uh, is looking at smaller scale plants, maybe sort of tens of megawatt, um, where the economies of scale are actually from just scaling up the production. So you just turn out lots of them and achieve economies of scale that way. Um, and there's a few companies looking at that. Um, and that looks like that, that may actually be a really promising for, way forward, so something to keep an eye on. So just quickly in conclusions, uh, basically what I've said, um, so biohydrogen, uh, I think it's, um, it's a good thing. Um, we're combining, as we've looked at, so negative emissions uh, with a really versatile energy vector. Um, there is this risk of there being a really big sort of chicken and egg problem. Um, and uh, here we need to be looking at, um, so we've got technical commercial infrastructure barriers, of course. Um, but I suppose that the, the broader point is that actually by starting to overcome them now, um, we can actually rapidly make this into something which is uh, really attractive, uh, both environmentally and economically. Um, and then this last point, again, hopefully the scale of transition here, um, the potential scale of transition is massive. Um, and so there are a bunch of other impacts. And so we do need to be a bit careful um, in looking at those. Thank you. All right, Sam, thank you. Nice presentation. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in with a quick question and then I'll open up to the audience. Oh, actually, no, if Braden's there, I don't need to go first. Braden, were you here to ask a question or are you joining the panel? Uh, I was here to join the panel. So uh, okay, we're doing the panel. Okay, well, let, let's let's just take a minute or two for, for Sam, then we'll, we'll open it up to the whole panel. Uh, but, you know, Sam, I was, I was interested in, in hearing you talk about the, the idea of how our support mechanisms need to be differentiated, right, based on the degree of, of emission reduction. One mm -hmm. of the, the criticisms that's been leveled at LCA is, you know, it can't give a single precise number, right? And there's been concerns over, like, these, you know, the EU fuel quality directive or low-carbon fuel standards in North America around can you really differentiate based on an LCA number when there isn't a single number, as you yourself were talking about, right, the choices mm -hmm. made by the people modeling. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you can comment on that sort of tension between needing to support the technologies with deeper reduction versus that degrees of freedom in the modeling. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, that's an excellent point. Um, yeah, I mean, you can. Um, I mean, one, one of the greatest problems is it, with that is, as I'm sure you're aware, is, is ambiguity over it. Um, and so there is a tension there between you need standards which um, remove that ambiguity for investment to be viable um, against there is actually but then without sort of ignoring the fact that there is actual ambiguity so um, yeah I'm not sure there is a real uh, solution I think both of those need to be treated separately as they're both sort of very real con concerns yeah no I, I, I give you a bit of an evil question there because I agree it's, it's very challenging um, I see a question from you on which is great talk um, what's the destination of the CO2 captured? Are they sent to permanent storage or to be used somewhere else? And um, would you comment on how their destinations were included in your own GHG mm, analysis? That's a really, that's a really good um, thing. So actually, sorry, so, so I'm completely clear. So that uh, analysis, that was just kind of a meta-analysis of, um, uh, there's kind of like a couple of dozen studies we looked at. Um, for the UK, um, a lot of folks at the moment, because uh, we've got quite a large um, there's large potential uh, underwater storage um, options. So actually a lot of people, are, I think the idea is that CO2 would be stored in these um, these large caverns. Um, so essentially, yeah, permanent storage. Um, 
Yeah, I guess like a lot of people, I do I do sort of feel like a certain un, sort of unease about that. Um, although I can't really put a finger on the reason why. The people who are looking at it are pretty confident about the permanence of it and and the sort of technology behind it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's other options as well in other places, of course. All right, great. Thanks, Sam. So I'll, I'll throw it open now to the whole panel, just watching the time. Uh, of course, I can still include questions for Sam. Uh, I think this one is for Braden, though, uh, which is, is, is the thermal storage an addition, uh, an addition or a replacement of carbon capture? I, I'm actually struggling to interpret. Braden, do you, do you understand the question? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think so. Somebody okay. correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're asking if thermal storage is used in place of carbon capture and it is not it's used in combination with carbon capture so we just use thermal storage to allow more flexibility for the power plant because right now carbon mm -hmm. capture places a large load on the power plants that they're attached to thanks yeah sam go ahead if you want to add something oh uh, no so I was, I was wondering a similar thing actually um i take a little while to think about stuff but um do, do you ever I, in sort of the scoping of your, your work there, did you look at um, kind of the option for basically turning off the, um, the carbon capture cycle uh, or, or sort of uh, reducing its, its level as, as a, another option for flexibility? Yeah, you mean to have more flexibility of the power plant itself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so um, we have looked at those and anytime it's expected that there's going to be some sort of carbon tax in the future, anytime you add a carbon tax on, emitting any level of emissions just kills the profitability of the power plant, as you can imagine. So even if it's at 50% carb capture rate, it's still way worse than 90 plus capture rate. That's why we see if we can capture 95 to 99% of carbon emissions, that's a huge benefit for these technologies. Would, would that be even at a relatively modest carbon price or do you need a steep price for that to become true? Um, what's modest in your eyes? <laughs> uh, what kind of price do you need for that statement to be true? <laughs> yeah, to, so, to be modest would be in the, you know, the tens, 10, 20, $30 a ton. Yeah. So usually the break even point between adding current carbon capture technologies onto a power plant is about $50 per ton. Um, in the work that we've done with Princeton and NREL, they're assuming costs of a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars per ton, so they're expecting way higher prices. That's why I asked the question because no, that's right. I mean, yeah, fifty to me, totally reasonable. Hundred, hundred and fifty, we need it politically. I'm not sure I believe that one, at least not immediately. I totally agree. Um, I have a question, maybe for the for anyone on the panel who wants to answer. But you know, so this session's looking at these carbon capture in one way or another, or. Um, you know, things that, that take existing carbon feedstocks. There, there's sort of a, I see sometimes a bit of a tension in the literature between looking at like a CCS uh, or, or, or BEX, right? Things where we have a climate overshoot and we capture uh, versus the camp that's sort of all about, well, we just need to shift completely away from fossil fuels and just focus on renewables. I guess that this question doesn't fully apply to all of you because the biomass is renewables. But I guess I'm just curious to hear how this group sort of feels about the idea of capturing or converting existing sources of carbon as compared to just, hey, let's stop emitting them. Yeah, I'll go first. I was having the same thought when I was listening to uh, Brendan and Sringa's uh, talks. I was like, is it is it really beneficial if we're capturing these carbons and using them for other things versus just eliminating them at the beginning, like you mentioned? And I think it's always going to be better to eliminate them if we can. But I think the, the people that I've talked about that are generating electricity, they think there's always gonna be some need for on-demand power that mm -hmm. um, they don't think renewable, even with thermal or uh, energy storage is gonna provide, the technologies just aren't there yet. And so they think there's always gonna be some sort of on-demand power needed um, they would like to see more nuclear, but there's all sorts of red tape associated with that, as you can imagine. So um, I, in my opinion, I think it's better just to reduce the emissions in the first place instead of having to capture it. But that puts me out of a job, so maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Question, questions from the audience, or if anyone else wants to weigh in or any other observations from the panel, sort of just looking across the talks today. 
I guess I can see our, our audience pool starting to shrink because we are getting right up near the, the 1.30 mark or 1.30 Eastern time. It shouldn't be Eastern centric, but. All right, why don't I leave it at that and then let's give people a chance to sort of mingle one. We, we can go out and if anyone wants to find any of the speakers individually. Uh, again, thank you all for, for a really interesting session. I really enjoyed all of the talks and I hope to follow up soon. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everyone.